what a remarkable and emotional movie we just we just watched. Um, I I hope you enjoyed the screening as well, and uh, please bear with us for a second until we um, we go live because we'll be live streaming the discussion on on Facebook of Mental Health Europe as well, and of on on Facebook of Medicating Normal, of course. Um, I think it was it was it is a very important movie, and it and it's and it, and it helps to understand lots of issues that are um, currently not only currently, but it's been a long, like, you know, a lot of, a, a long lasting problem in mental health field. And, and, and as Mental Health Europe, again, we are very much, very, very glad that we can host uh, today's uh, screening and discussion with a, with a great panel of experts. So I'm just looking towards Angie to, to, to wait for the okay. sign. But no worries, take just your time. Pressing the button. Meantime, yeah. I'm gonna maybe it's just start really something. Slow. Uh, for something that is important for the for the participants here um, on the platform. So before we start, let me just give you a little bit of uh, of Zoom instructions. Um, we have quite a crowd tonight with us, um, and it would be great to, apart from our discussion and my questions for our great uh, speakers, um, hear your questions and and be able to answer them. Uh, so for that, I would encourage you to use the Q and A box. Don't use chat, please, because it 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 it, um, it poses a danger that we will lose your questions and we will not be able to to po to pose them to our panelists. So please use the Q and A. Uh, you can find it at the bottom of the screen. Um, there is my colleague from Mental Health Europe who will be helping out with that. Um, if you would like to remain anonymous, there is uh, there is a feature in the Q and A box uh, where you can ask an anonymous question. Uh, I will not be uh, reading out the names of the people that are um, that are posing the questions, so you can you you can ask your question anonymously automatically. Uh, the recording will be also available at the Mental Health Europe's website and, and Medicating, Norm Medicating Normal's YouTube channel uh, in a due time. So uh, just for you to know that the chat box and the Q and A's will not be saved. So I'm just I'm just. Uh, trying to, to still to it's, it's going really worries. really really slow I'm trying no worries I can maybe just start and then we, we see where we go um, slowly by introducing maybe sure. a little bit mental health Europe so so again um, my name is Marcin Rajinka for those of you that uh, that uh, that joined a bit later um, and I work as advocacy and policy officer at Mental Health Europe um, MAG is a European network of uh, users professionals service providers, um, really lots of organizations and individuals that are uh, working in mental health fields in European region. Um, and uh, we are extremely happy, again, I would like to stress that, uh, to join forces with the Medicating Normal team to be able to bring this, uh, this extremely important film um, to you tonight and have a great uh, panel discussion with an amazing set of experts that I can already see that are joining and are ready to, 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 to contribute. Um, I would like to uh, this discussion to focus on two main elements. One is on the mental health um, aspects and, and, and our approach as a society to mental health. We'll also hear amazing stories of uh, individual stories and experiences of, of uh, people with, with psychiatric medication and withdrawing from it. But also we are joined by experts that will uh, tell us a little bit more about the, um, the pharmaceutical industry's influence over medical education and research. And, and we saw a little bit of that uh, in the movie, um, but also, you know, from the European perspective, uh, that, is, that is also very, very important to bear in mind that, um, that this is a, a Euro European context that we're meeting uh, in, to in tonight um, that might be a little bit different in details than the one presented in Medicating Normal. Uh, so uh, just just for you to know, um, I'm not a mental health professional, uh, but having my own experience and working for Mental Health Europe, um, I will do my best to moderate tonight's discussion. And we wouldn't be Mental Health Europe if we didn't talk about uh, a policy change and try to come up with policy recommendations for policymakers uh, to change this worrying situation. And uh, again, using just taking two more minutes of, of the introduction, I would like to stress uh, two um, important elements of Mental Health Europe work in this field. One is the Shedding Light project that we, we, we started in 2018 um, and we've been running constantly until 
today that focuses on uh, the relationships between the pharmaceutical industry and mental health care sector. So, so in last year, we published a report that is an overview of the, of the legal situation in Europe when it comes to the sunshine laws. So that's kind of a good, good context for the, for, the, for the discussion. And the second element is our third guide. Um, and the third was published yesterday. And it's actually a short guide to psychiatric medication. So again, it's a very much uh, linked with today's discussion. So tonight we are lucky uh, because we are joined by a panel of amazing experts. And let me uh, slowly start introducing uh, the panel to you. Um, so uh, in no particular order, but I will start with, pro with Peter Kinderman, who is um, a professor of clinical psychology at the, at the University of, of Liverpool and a chartered clinical psychologist, former president of um, the British Psychological Society, who is also one of the co-authors of the short guide, short guide to um, psychiatric medication issued by Mental Health Europe yesterday. We have Professor David Klemperer, uh, who is a doctor of internal medicine, professor of social medicine and public health member, and public health, apologies, member of the Drug Commission of the German Medical Association and uh, its expert committee for transparency and independence in medicine. We have Stella Göschl, I um, hope I pronounced the name correctly, who is a health policy director at European Medical um, Students Association, a society that works a lot as well on medical education from the undergraduate perspective. And we have three great mental health advocates and campaigners who are joining us tonight. First is a person that you saw already in Medicating Normal, Angie Peacock, um, who is a subject of the film, also an activist and a social worker. We have Dominique Demarne, uh, who is a mental health advocate, member of Mental Health Europe, actually senior policy advisor to Mental Health Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, we have also with us to, uh, tonight, Stevie Lewis, who is UK-based campaigner for better recognition and support for prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. Welcome you all. It's my great pleasure to be to be joined uh, uh, to be joined by you tonight. And I will start by um, asking a couple of questions to each of you, and then we'll move on to the Q and A uh, part of tonight's discussion. So again, I encourage everyone to to ask questions in the Q and A box. Remember, no chat. So first, um, I would like to start off by asking each of you. What's your impression uh, after watching Medicating Normal? Your, your first reaction, first comments? Uh, do you find the movie important? Um, who would like to start? Dom Dominique, would you like to go first? I can start. Uh, well, on the one hand, I really was a bit shocked here and there um, about the stories and I really felt with the protagonists. And on the other hand, my own experiences are way different than these. And so sometimes I would have wished for a more balanced view, but this side, telling this side of people with those symptoms and with these stories is really, really important. Um, and I think it was really, really well done. And I thank all the people that have shared their stories so that others can learn from it. So that's my, my short. <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much. Who would like to go next? Stevie? Sure, um, I will. Uh, well, there were a number of things in there that um, uh, that I recognized and there was a particular part which I, I've seen the film twice now and that has made me really well up each time and that um, is where um, um, the psychiatrist actually said that there's a cohort of people for whom um, um, withdrawal coming off these drugs is exquisitely painful and actually I hear that sentence and it means a great deal to me to actually hear it said and hear it said out loud because that's what withdrawal was like for me. Um, I think that one of the things that is I found really useful in the film that is that you saw this inherent tension uh, played out between uh, two apparently conflicting beliefs that we come across all the time and that I've mentioned before when I've spoken on this subject. Uh, the husband and wife team there, Brie and David, you had a situation where two experiences the, of the same drug, um, one person where the drugs have helped and the other person where the drugs have harmed. And we're in this situation where it's potluck really, no one knows, 
um, who is going to be helped and who is going to be harmed, but is so important in our campaigning and for everyone to understand that we need to be able to hold both these beliefs as true, um, so that we we don't we 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 don't um, we don't find ourselves with the charge that we're stigmatizing people or that we're anti-psychiatry or anti-drugs. It is true that people are helped and people are harmed. Thank you, Stevie. Thank you. That's 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 a very important words that you said at the end. Uh, anyone else would like to comment very 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 quickly on um, before we go? Just echo what what Stevie has said. So uh, part of when I watch this film and then films like it, I get very frustrated because you know the efforts of medical professionals to help people in great distress has to be welcomed. I, I think that the medical perspective on mental health has some merit. Um, and I think that the drugs, especially in the short term, can be helpful for people. What I find frustrating is that people are misled about the uh, dependence forming properties of these drugs. They're told that they've got illnesses that have to be put right by medication. They're told that it's like taking insulin for, for diabetes. They're told that there are no uh, adverse effects. And if we were just honest, I think we'd have a much, I mean, as Steve is hinting, if we were honest about the drugs, about the limits of our knowledge, about the fact that not every solution works for everybody, and about the adverse effects of this medication, I think we'd have a much more, more healthy approach to the medication, including welcoming some of the benefits that it can bring. I mean, I, I'm, I'm informed a lot by the work of Joanna Moncrief and the idea that the drugs are actually powerful and have some uh, helpful, powerful effects, but that they're not treatments for underlying illnesses. So, so I'm frustrated by, by all of this. Yeah, it's it's it is a definitely um, like very emo you know very emotional movie and 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 I had you know see, you know working in this field for a bit I had the same the same feelings you know that 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 and and, and what I hope is clear you know before we started the the discussion here is that you know we 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 brought a lot of people together and you know we are not anti meds we are we are not trying to you know to to promote this approach that's why um, soon we will also move on to the to the personal stories of of. Uh, people also to see the variety of experiences. And this is, you know, something that I would like to acknowledge very strongly um, in this discussion. Anyone else before the? Yeah, I just wanna, just one thing about helping and then hurting is that six years ago before the film was made, I would have been, I would have said that the, the pills were helping me, that, that I was functioning well, I was feeling pretty good. Um, I was just thinking about this morning actually that I was running like a 5K once a month. I was doing intensive exercise mud runs enjoying my school time and then one day they just turned on me you know and we don't know when that happens either so i think it, our stories aren't always static they're not going to help you forever or, or they might hurt you or they might not hurt you you know what i mean it's it, there's always things changing the body's always changing i think that what uh, what the film shows uh is, is a kind of dark side of psychiatry uh, patients with carelessly made diagnosis and misguided drug therapy, medication prescribed for too long a period, multi-medications. I also saw professionals capable of critical thinking and communicating well, but uh, I saw one doctor who was completely ignorant and arrogant, and that seems to be possible. The patients would have benefited from more empathy more professional advice and support, more information about the drugs and from a good relation with that therapist, I think. I could just add one thing to that. I feel like um, what we really, um, what made me think was seeing these doctors who were willing to prescribe um, medication without giving the full information. Um, it just made me kind of question, you know, like where did that start? It's obviously, obviously this is what we are working on in the European Medical Students Association. But it's um, really, it, it shows that it goes to the core and that it's something that starts fairly early on and that really needs to be targeted straight away. Thanks a lot. So, so the doctors may not have given the full information about the drugs because they didn't know it. Yeah, and we will move on. Uh, we will talk about this as well tonight. But before that, indeed, like we, we, we already touched upon this, but indeed, like, you know, recognizing that people have different experiences uh, you, you know, with, with, with mental ill health, with psychiatric medication, with trying to withdraw from it. I would like to now give the floor to, to, uh, to a very important part of, of the, tonight's discussion, which is asking Angie, Stevie and Dominique to share their, you know, briefly personal stories and experiences with psychiatric medication. 
it's ready to to give the floor to people with lived experience and 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 you know to kind of to create a base for the for the for the further discussion so i wouldn't like to uh, you know say who should start but i can see that stevie unmuted herself so maybe she would like to start <laughs> okay i will um well, I should say here that um, whenever I, I talk this evening, I, I'm talking predominantly about antidepressants because that's where my experience lies. Um, so it was um, um, late 1996 when I was first uh, prescribed an SSRI antidepressant. Um, I was suffering from intermittent um, insomnia, um, only in certain circumstances when I went away on business. And I had some hormonal issues as quite often a 41 year old woman does. And I was told, I, 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 had, um, I had an agenda. I, I just wanted some sleeping tablets to take on, uh, on the intermittent basis. But I, I was quite shocked to, uh, after the doctor had asked me some more questions to get a, um, a diagnosis that I was on the edge of a clinical depression um, and that I had a chemical imbalance in my brain. Um, and uh, I believed him. Um, that I had this chemical imbalance in my brain and that this drug was going to put it right. I mean, it was a complete shock to get this diagnosis, but I had no reason to disbelieve him. I questioned him. I was told that it wasn't addictive, um, this drug that I was taking. Um, although, of course, we have learned subsequently that SSRI antidepressants aren't addictive in the true sense of the word because you don't crave them, but they are dependents for me. So when I tried to stop taking these drugs, um, I found I became more ill than when I originally went to see him. Um, we assumed I got a generalized anxiety disorder because the symptoms seemed to be getting worse. This didn't seem to make sense to me because over time I started to be able to see a pattern. Um, as I tried to stop them myself, I would become ill quite quickly. And as I reinstated, I became, um, I became better again, equally quickly. So after um, a few years of this, I did some research on the internet and I found that there were, was a group of people out there on the same drug having exactly the same problem. Uh, so I was rather shocked to discover that I was drug dependent effectively. I called myself a prescription junkie because I didn't have any other vocabulary to describe to people what I thought was happening to me. Over a long period of time, I constantly kept trying to stop tapering, failing. I put myself on a very, very low maintenance dose, 1.78 mil of the liquid of this particular antidepressant. Um, however, in the end, I developed a movement disorder. So in 2009, um, 11 years this month, actually, out of the blue, I developed a movement disorder. I saw a variety of neurologists. I was told that I had a functional neurological disorder which means that there's nothing noticeable in the brain, but clearly there were aspects of my nervous system and muscular system which aren't working properly. Um, I jerk violently as if I'm having an epileptic fit. Uh, by 2013, I recognized, I, I was sure, um, and I took some advice, I was sure that this was to do with the drug. And so I stopped from this very small dose, but it was enough to knock me into four years of very, very extreme withdrawal. Um, movement disorder became worse. Insomnia, I mean, no sleep. I couldn't sleep. If I got an hour a night, I was fortunate. I was terrified the whole time. I developed phobias. Um, my gut became dysfunctional. I lost lots of weight. My mind uh, found danger everywhere. This world I was operating in was just a completely different place. Four years. Um, and then in 2017, as I was starting to feel a little more like me again, I found through social media that there were people still being told the same story as me, still being told that they had a chemical imbalance. Um, so I started campaigning and I started a petition because I live here in Wales to bring to the attention of the Welsh government and to the public how difficult it can be to become off certain prescribed medications. And I had um, antidepressants predominantly in mind, but I also knew about benzos as well. So that is my story and how I got to be here. 
Thank you very much for sharing it. And, 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 you know, when I learned about your activism as well, you know, based on your experience that, that you developed in, in Wales that, that, uh, and, and also research that you did with a couple of, you, you know, people, I was, I was very positively impressed. And, and I think that's, that's also a positive thing that we can, you know, kind of take from our, from our, from our experience. I would like to ask maybe Dominique to, to go as the next one. Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, my my illness started when I was a teenager. It took about 10 years until I found out that I was just sick and not just wrong or weak or anything. And then I started therapy um, after quite a while. And for me, from the beginning, it was clear that I didn't want to take any medication because I have just heard these horror stories that you become a completely different person, that you gain lots of weights and all these stories that are just um, around. And so for me, it was always clear, no, um, this is not for me. And then I went uh, inpatient into a clinic for uh, three months and there they they wanted me to take something, but I was quite robust and said, no, no, I don't need it. It's okay. Um, and they were okay with that. And I got more and more stable. I got my illnesses under control and with all the therapy and all hard work. And after a couple of months, quite a bad crisis hit me. So I became suicidal again. And it was one of my best friends. He's a doctor and he asked me, okay, I've been watching you for years now and would you maybe try some medication, some antidepressants, um, would you do it for me? And I was like, okay, I'm doing it for him. And then I went uh, to my first psychiatrist. He wasn't really good, um, but the second one I found was amazing. And she took a lot of time to find the right medication for me. And as soon as I started as I felt the medication start working, I was like, why did I wait so long? It was such a relief for me because, um, so for me, it's borderline personality disorder, it's depression, social anxiety, and alcohol addiction. And I was fighting these all on my own. And at least for one of these, for the depression, there would have been somebody who could have helped me in fighting the depression. And as soon as I started the medication, I felt like, okay, there's now somebody on my side um, who is dealing with the depression so I can deal with my other illnesses. Uh, and for me, it was really a very good experience. And um, it took a couple of, of tries till I found the right medication for me. Um, I took it three years. And this year I decided, okay, I'm, I want to start trying again, living without it. Um, because I really felt stable and I've been sober for quite a while and everything felt good. So I started to, to lower the dose. And for me, this part was also really easy. My body, my brain, um, they took it all very well. I had no withdrawal symptoms. So for me, the medication was just in a time of need, in a time where my illnesses were quite strong. I had something that helped me. And when I decided, okay, I can try it on my own now, um, they went away. So this is my experience. I know that there are a lot of other stories, but I also find it very important to tell these stories as well, because I could have saved a lot of time if I would have heard maybe some more stories like mine. Yeah, that's my story. Thank you very, very, very much. I fully agree that you know that that what we what we and, and what we are trying to do is really to you know present the spectrum of, of, of you know different you know different ex experiences that are human, you know, hum, human experiences. What I picked up from what you were saying and, and, and it's what, what was also clear uh, from one uh, subject from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, from the medicating normal movie was the, you know, the, 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 the that, that's also my experience, the time of the consultation that, that kind of ends up with the prescription for the medication, you know, in your, in your case, I think, you know, that's, that's just my quick interpretation of what might have been helpful in your case was that you know, indeed, so, you know, someone took more time, you know, really consider different options, you know, analyze the situation. Um, and, and I think it, that's definitely, you know, I think a helpful factor. Uh, Angie, would you like to add something sure. to what we saw from the movie? Sure. So, so um, my experience with psychiatric drugs started pretty slowly. It was, um, it, uh, benzo was first for anxiety and post-traumatic stress. 
then it was an antidepressant was added and then um i got i've got very bad pretty quickly but they kept telling me like you saw in the film that that's your ptsd you're severe um, there was a period of time where i didn't leave my house for four years i've had seven hospitalizations and basically um, all my meds are like this where it's just this long 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 list of all the things that i tried you know it was um i was i mean i went to therapy once a week i did 12-step groups i did um any support i could find because i just wanted to feel better so I would always ask the doctor, you know, I still have anxiety. I still have severe nightmares. I have this and that, you know, and then they would try another one and then, okay, that's not working. And like you saw in the film, it's just like, it just kept going on and on. Um, and it wasn't until maybe I met a doctor who said, I'm a psychiatrist who doesn't believe in psychiatry, who put you on all these meds. We have to take you off. And so I entered a facility for about 45 days. They took me off like 10 of the drugs. I hallucinated. It was extremely scary. And then it took me 10 more years to get off of everything else. And it was just a slow, you know, it was a curiosity within me that was like, who am I without meds or what feelings are mine and what are side effects? Or why is it that I feel um, like the world is happening outside of me, but I can't quite touch it. Why don't I feel a part of the world, you know? And it almost happened so slowly. It was almost imperceptible that, you know, I slowly lost touch with friends. I slowly cared less about my hygiene or like boyfriends or seeing my family, like all these things just slowly started disappearing from my life and my life got smaller and smaller, but the doctors kept saying, that's your major depression. That's your post-traumatic stress. You know, that's trauma. That's what trauma does. My sexual side effects, that was attributed to trauma. But now that I'm five years off of everything, I can look back and see that it just, I tried my earnest to get these things to work for me and they did not, you know, they either made me worse or kept me from myself or kept me from my family or functioning. And a lot of people, when they see the film, they're, they say things like, well, those are normal people. And, you know, what about extreme people? But I'm telling you, I was, I, it's in my medical records everywhere that I was chronic, severely, severe, persistent mental illness, SMI. Like that was the label that I carried. I have like six diagnoses. Um, now I'm five years off and I still suffer from the protracted withdrawal syndrome that basically the drugs just change the way my nervous system works. And I have all the same diagnosis. I would still meet criteria for DSM-5. I even have more stuff like extreme states that I experience, but I know I can't take another med. Like it will kill me, literally blow my brain up. So I have this fragility about me and I have to live a certain way to, to, to be okay in the world. And I'm careful who I share that those feelings with and those symptoms and everything. And I'm just trying to redefine what health and wellness means to me with my own experiences. And I thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Angel. I do appreciate that. Let me turn uh, to Peter now. I was I was struck by by one phrase from the from the military psychotherapist from the from the movie who said that we confuse uh, normal with comfortable. And based on that in our lives or generally as a, as a society, we tend to look for, 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 for easy fix or for, you know, for the, um, for the quick, quick fix as well, which is very often in the context of mental health uh, and medication. Do you, what do you think about our current approach to mental health as a society um, in Europe? Is it, is it the right one? Where are we with, uh, with our thinking about mental health? Okay, so so that's a huge question, but uh, but a great, I a great question. Um, I know there are so many aspects to it. So um, I think that the idea that we we take medication in order to get a quick fix, partly. So we need to be careful. There are a lot of people who suffer enormously from psychological problems, mental health problems. Um, you know, if, if somebody is hearing disembodied voices telling them to kill themselves every hour of the day. Seeking some respite from that isn't a quick fix. Seeking respite from that is, is something necessary. And you know, if, if everyday life is just generally not worth living, then I, I sympathize with people finding a solution to it. But Clive Sherlock on the Q&A just asked about the difference between prescription medication and street drugs. And I think over many, many years, over millennia, we've learned that, that chemical fixes for problems in our lives tend to be unwise. They work in the short term, but they have major problems lasting. So you know, if I was having trouble with relationship difficulties with my partner, getting drunk every night is not a good solution. 
um, if I was finding that life wasn't particularly enthralling and, uh, um, you know, uh, spiritually uplifting for me, then taking MDMA every day uh, wouldn't be a good solution for it. So I think it's not about the short term quick fix for the troubles of normal life. I think it's that we've learned through millennia that chemical solutions to these major problems in our lives tend to have negative consequences. That leads on to two things, I think. The first is um, that our whole approach to mental health, I think, is based on the idea that what we're doing is treating illnesses. And we still have people talking about chemical imbalance. I, I, I do care what, the, what my colleagues say about it. It's never been believed by the psychiatric establishment, but it's on the patient information leaflets for Prozac. It's in the media. So this idea is, uh, I'm not so, so concerned by quick fix. I'm more concerned by the idea that we are told there's something wrong with us and the drugs will put it right. And there literally is no evidence for that. There is no evidence for that at all. What there is evidence for is that drugs might be helpful, but not stunningly helpful. And that leads on to the fact that people are told, we, we all believe that we're taking the medication to put something right. That leads on to when we stop taking the medication and have withdrawal effects, then we think that it's a relapse of the existing illness. We don't look for other solutions because we're told it's... So this whole idea of pathologizing psychological distress. I mean, the idea that you would go to war in Iraq, come back traumatized by your experience and be told there's something wrong with you. I think conceptually there's, there's something wrong with that and the medication follows from that. So I, I don't think it's wrong for us to seek quick fixes. I think it's wrong for us to pathologize these problems and look to medicate them away. Thank you very much. And, and, and open question to everyone really like what based on uh, based on what what we said so far why what are the root causes or like why do you think that that the alternatives to medication in mental health care are still not accessible and available enough in europe because i think that's that's a, another thing that 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 struck me in my work and in this movie as well was the fact that the number of people that get very easy and very quickly prescription for medication when they seek mental health support um, and they don't really get or are not even offered other options. Um, why is that? Is it is it a problem with, a, with, you know, with the system? Is it a, a lack of knowledge? Is it a combination of the both? What would you say from your experience from the European context? Stevie, go ahead. Sure. Um, root cause of being over-reliant on drugs. Well, what I see is one of the problems is that now this has almost become, become consumer-led. And I want to take you back to the mid-90s and what happened here in the UK. It was a key turning point with something called the Defeat Depression Campaign. Um, the there was a push by the Royal College of Psychiatry and GPs to try and um, improve depression uh, rates in the UK. And they did some research and they found that people were, felt that antidepressants were addictive um, and not a first port of call. It wasn't a good idea to do this. Now, of course, the drug companies were involved in this defeat depression campaign as well. And there was some work done to persuade doctors about the chemical imbalance story um, and that um, antidepressant withdrawal was uh, mild and transient um, and was a very safe and effective drug. And this is where this is where the chemical metaphor, chemical imbalance metaphor actually came from. And what this did is it sucked people like me into the mental health system because I and uh, many others that we found in the research that we did turned up in our doctor's surgery with um, something that we deemed, with, there was effectively a life issue. So with some of the people in, in our research, you know, they, they were physically ill or they'd had bereavement, um, they'd had work stresses, but when they arrive in the doctor's surgery, it's first port of call is an antidepressant. So this has started to permeate into society that this is what you do. And in, U in the US, we saw on the film that they did it through advertising. And suddenly everybody knows about serotonin. Everybody knows that serotonin is, 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 is um, connected with mood and low serotonin equals low mood. And a low mood equals depression for which you take an antidepressant, which alters the level 
so say, alters the level of serotonin in your body. Uh, and we now have a situation where we have different uh, generations of the same family. So I was reading the Daily Mail recently, taking an antidepressant, and that people will actually go to their doctor and not say, I have in, I, I, I'm having trouble sleeping or eating. They will say, I am depressed. I want an antidepressant. Even in... Um, even on wellness blogs that you can read uh, on the internet now, serotonin is mentioned. Are you getting enough serotonin from your food, from your exercise? It's there. It's in, our, it's in the psyche now over the past 20 or so years. Um, this is how come we've ended that in England, you've got 17% of adults um, taking, taking a, a, an antidepressant. And why aren't there any alternatives? Well, why would they? Why would there be? Doctors believe this is safe and effective drug. It's cheap. Um, it's easy to get off, apparently, for some people, but not for a lot of others. So what's not to like? And I see that that's how we're partly in this situation. Thank you, Stevie. And I would like to move on now to, to David, because what I think, for me, what's, what's one of the root cause is that you know, it, 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 it lies in this, you know, in this undue influence of the pharmaceutical industry over, over education and over research. Um, that shapes, you know, further thinking and, you know, it shaped the chemical imbalance narrative and, and, and a couple of other things. Would you be able, David, to, to, to kind of to guide us through, um, you know, through the issues with the pharmaceutical industry involvement in medical education and research in a nutshell, what's really the problem with the involvement of the industry in, in education? Try my best. And I think it's not the, the pharmaceutical industry which invented the biomedical model, but it takes advantage of it. And the bi biomedical thinking is deeply ingrained into us. We physicians, physicians are trained in the biomedical model and that means Patients come to us, they have a problem, and we look for a cause for that problem in the body with the help of blood tests and imaging techniques. And finally, we make a diagnosis and decide on a therapy to, to correct what is wrong in the body. And when we decide on the therapy and give the therapy, it's deeply satisfying for us because we have solved the problem at least we have the feeling that we have helped the patients because we love to help patients, of course. Uh, this is a biomedical way of thinking. And this model does work well, especially in acute situations. It's a very strong model. And uh, it works in fixing fractures or treating hypertensive emergencies. It works less well in chronic conditions and in multimorbidity. And it sometimes works in psychiatry, but often it does not work well, at least not, not alone, the, the drugs alone, if they are given alone. I think the chemical imbalance theory is mostly wrong, but it's so attractive, very attractive for, for doctors. And we know that you cannot locate depression or psychosis in the body. Uh, that's why psychiatry clearly needs a bias cycle Bio, bio psychosocial model, mm, but we do not have the means to live that in every, our everyday practice. And so we just do what, what is easy. We apply the biomedical model to patients with psychiatric problems. Uh, I could say more about the influence of, of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I think the influence is Mm. is in, in the research. Drug studies usually are fully controlled by the drug sponsor or manufacturer. The study design, the collection of data, the statistical analysis, the interpretation of the results, decisions on which results are published and which are not published are all in the hands of the industry. And Peter Götsch has said torturing data until they confess that's still possible because nobody looks into the details of the studies. <clears throat> the, the data are not public. And questions that are important for patients are often not investigated, like side effects, 
long-term effects and possible problems with discontinuing a drug. And pharmaceutical companies have many ways to create conflicts of interest and to influence doctors. They pay doctors as their consultants, as we have heard. They sponsor medical societies. They sponsor scientific meetings. Conflicted, conflicted doctors are involved in, in guideline developments, in teaching students, in lecturing colleagues. Drum and Rennie said, nothing the pharmaceutical industry does, does is more scientific than its marketing. Drum and Rennie, Rennie is a former editor of the, uh, of the New England Journal of Medicine and the JAMA, the Journal of the Amer American Medical Association. So he has insider knowledge like hardly anybody else. I think the current system of drug development and drug approval and drug marketing serves the interest of the pharmaceutical industry and it needs to be overhauled so that it serves patients and the populations. And that is much easier said than done. And for, um, yeah, unfortunately, I fully, fully agree. This is, you know, this is a big, big problem. And, and, and just to expand on what you said and bring more mental health specificity, I would like to turn to Peter now. Um, you know, the, 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 the problem with, with the psychiatric medication or the research on psychiatric medication very often, you know, is, 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 the, is the wrong picking of the outcomes and then it has the impact on, on lots of other things. Uh, there's also, you know, a, 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 du a, du a duration of the study that has an impact on the, um, on the final information that then is utilized within the system. Could you explain a little bit that? Uh, yeah, yeah. One sentence. It's the right. It's the right picking of endpoints from yeah. the from the view of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. They make everything right. That, that's exactly the point. So so um, I I now sit on uh, one of the clinical guideline development groups in the UK. So I'm looking at the data that we have on the effectiveness of both antidepressant medication and psychotherapies for people who have been diagnosed with depression. And the whole thing is there in a nutshell. So first of all, the guidelines are developed on essentially a, a biomedical basis. These are treatments for particular disorders. This is not a, a systematic review of the things that make people happy or even the things that make people less depressed. This is a systematic review of the treatments for the disorder of depression. So we're already in a certain territory. And then what we see is we see, to be honest, you know, I have to, I'm a scientist, I have to follow the data. And the data are very clear that in, in the published studies, you see a clinical benefit of antidepressant medication. If you record, if you, if you trust the papers that are published as opposed to the papers that are not published, that's a huge issue. And if you take the measured endpoints at the point at which the pharmaceutical companies or, or people exploring pharmaceutical treatments uh, choose to record the endpoints, but that's typically eight weeks for the use of antidepressant medication, whereas people take antidepressant medication typically for hugely longer time periods. So when, again, coming back to a question that came up earlier, when we're comparing, when we're saying, you know, do these drugs work? How do they work? Do they work in terms of helping people? Do they improve our sleep? Do they reduce our levels of stress and so forth? The impact of serotonin reuptake inhibitors after eight weeks of taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors may be completely different from the impact of these drugs after three years. So we're, we're measuring the, uh, the impact on our mood or on our functioning within a psychiatric framework and at the optimum moment for the people who develop the drugs, but they're being used in a completely way, different way in clinic. So what I can do, even sitting on a guideline development panel, is take the data that I've got. What I don't have access to is the unpublished data from the pharmaceutical companies. I don't have data on adverse effects other than the adverse effects collected by the people who do the trials. I don't have long-term data on outcome. I don't have data on how outcomes in terms of depressed mood might improve after eight weeks and then deteriorate after 24 weeks. So we only have very partial data on which to make these decisions. And I think that's important. I think we need to take a step back and think of not only about the data that we have available, but about the data that should be available to enable us to make more intelligent decisions. And that's a regulatory issue. You know, do we regulate the drugs on the basis of what they have published now, or do we say, we're going to insist on certain standards before we approve these drugs? And I would vote for the latter. 
Thanks a lot, Peter. It's um, yeah, it's very very worrying, and indeed, it's it's a it's a regular, it's a regulatory issue in in Europe as well. It, you know, the, the 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 European Medicines Agency, and I think all the agencies at the at the, at the national level in European countries, they they really, I mean, that's that's really a problem everywhere that they work with the exist. I mean, I mean with available data. And um, recently, I, I witnessed that discussion um, at the CME forum a couple of weeks ago. So, so the forum that gathered uh, people and institutions working with the uh, postgraduate medical education, you know, saying that that there is a reasonable um, argument for the pharmaceutical industry to be involved in medical education because only them. Um, that's the only actor in the system that have that that has all the data and all the information on the on the medicines and. You know that struck me a lot because you know if that's the case, then 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 it really shows that we have a big problem with a with the system. But I would like to now turn to Stella to talk a little bit about the undergraduate um, medical education. As as the European Medical Students Association, you developed a lot of work on you know trying to tackle the the, the influence that appears very early um, at the medical schools already, and, and and the pharmaceutical companies and the industries present there. Why did you consider this to be a problem, and, 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 and what did you do as EMSA to, 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 to tackle this issue? Yeah, um, that's correct. We've been working on this topic of kind of conflicts, um, conflicts of interest in medical education settings for um, some years now. Um, one of my predecessors um, started working on this topic, um, and it's something that's uh, been a priority to us within um, our health policy pillar. Um, for some time now, because it's just, um, it's, as we can see, it's a topic that has such broad, um, has such broad effects, has such broad, um, you know, um, um, uh, sorry, um, has such a broad influence on um, the population in different ways. So for example, um, not only obviously does this uh, affect patients, but me coming from a medical student's perspective, viewing kind of the future of, of doctors, it really shows that this um, is something that starts at the beginning and that can be tackled at the beginning if uh, we work on it, if we work to kind of combat these conflicts of interest. But um, the thing is that um, they, they happen and they happen without us knowing. So there have been many studies that have showed that um, with, if uh, students are exposed to conflicts of interest like that at sort of their very beginning of their, um, of their academic career and of their education, um, that it can really even blind them towards this bias even more than, than they already might be. So kind of the earlier on that you're exposed to this, the more you'll be impacted by it and the, the less you'll actually be aware of it. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons that we really feel like this is something essential to work on because, um, you know, we saw in the, in the documentary, we saw a doctor giving false information. We don't know if he, if he truly believes it, if he was, you know, if it was his um, conflict of interest, but it might've been that he just learned that at medical school because his professors had conflicts of interest. Um, so it's really, you know, we need to come from, from two angles. We need to tackle misinformation and we need to tackle conflicts of interest. And it's really at the medical, medical education setting where these can really start and where these can really develop um, in the first place. So um, what we've been doing um, is we've published policy papers on this uh, topic, specifically, obviously, targeting med uh, medical education. Um, we've also um, kind of been working on a topic, um, on a project, um, together with another medical students association to further work on this, to further target this, and to raise awareness of it. Because um, as you mentioned earlier, we need to kind of, we're in a, in a European setting today. We're kind of talking about the way that it is in Europe specifically. Um, and we've heard, um, obviously, some of some of the stories, um, well, actually, most of the stories in the movie were from the US. Um, and there is really kind of a difference that we need to consider within these two um, regions. Because in the US, we know that we know that it's a big problem. And students associations have actually managed to address this um, quite well in the US. There's been a guideline published by the American Students Association, um, American Medical Students Association, Association sorry, um, on how to kind of combat this in the medical curriculum. Um, and this is something that we've been kind of trying to look at and trying to see how we can implement that on a European level. Because um, Europe, obviously, um, the European Union, let's say, is a compilation of different states that each have individual uh, laws, each have individual kind of regulations. 
And it's quite a challenge actually to make sure that this is implemented on a wider level um, and that we can make sure that, that in Europe these regulations are actually taken into consideration because um, what we've seen is that European countries have not been as receptive to these measures, have not been as willing to kind of uh, distance themselves and uh, make sure that that conflicts of interest are actually addressed properly. But that's sort of um, a goal of ours to kind of really tackle that in the future. Thank you very much. And I'm, and I'm always impressed, you know, when, when working with EMSA by, you know, by your, by your commitment to, to, to the cause, you know, like, like, and that it's really noticed and, and, and tackled by the, by the, by the, by the medical students, really by the group, you know, that will be a future generation of doctors and, you know, you know, being aware of the possible bias and, and, you know, and the gaps in, in, in medical education and the failures, it's really, it's really, you know, it's really the first step. I would like to now turn towards the, the Q&A session so we have enough time to, to answer at least a couple of questions. Um, and one that, that, I, that I noticed, um, that, that there are actually two questions about, around uh, normal and not normal, trying to make a connection with the, with the title of the, of the film. And there's one question, uh, what do you think of antipsychotic medication or the use of antipsychotic when a person is having a serious crisis? Are there viable alternatives from your perspective? So that, that that's something that a little bit Dominique touched upon, but also in our in our in our discussion that you know that that the psychiatric medication might be used when when there's really a, uh, might be useful when there's really a crisis. Hmm. Anyone would like to answer to that? I, I've I've worked both as a researcher and a clinician with people who who are experiencing acute psychosis uh, over the years, and I've thought and I've also have personal experience of these, uh, these matters um, uh, within my family. And uh, interesting, I did actually take some chlorpromazine for a while in order to see what it was like, which is okay. Um, my, my view is that if, if I were to um, develop an acute psychotic episode now, I would want several things to happen. The first thing is I would want a very well, a, a competent uh, doctor physical doctor to check out that there wasn't something terribly going wrong, you know, a brain aneurysm, um, acute poisoning, some sort of metabolic disease. So I really would want medics to be involved, not because I think schizophrenia is a real medical illness, but because I think real medical illness can sometimes be, make people psychotic. So that's the first thing is I really do want medics to be involved, but I still don't think schizophrenia is in any sense a, a, a real illness along those lines. The second thing is I would absolutely take antipsychotic medication in the very short term. I've seen enough people hugely distressed in psychotic episodes to know that if I were that distressed, I would really want something to bring me down. But I wouldn't want to take it for any more than actually a few hours until the crisis has passed. I, I personally would politely decline taking antipsychotic medication on a long-term basis. And I think that's, I mean, that might be a very glib answer, but I think that's part of this discussion here, which is, this is part of how we see these problems and how we see the drugs and what we think is going on and some of the assumptions we're making about why they might be helpful. So, so my personal view is, you know, I would take an antipsychotic medication, a neuroleptic in the very short term, get through the crisis and, and then want to address the issues that are causing it. And like I say, I'd also want a medic just to check out there wasn't some physical disease uh, causing the process. So antipsychotics as a, as a long-term treatment for schizophrenia, uh, I'm not convinced by the efficacy of the drugs and I'm not convinced of the, the theory behind their use. Thank you, Peter. Anyone, anyone, anyone else would like to add something? If not, we can move on to the to the next one that I picked up. That is actually for um, to Stella. Um, there's a, there's a question if I'm not wrong about a practical example uh, of a conflict of interest that 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 you encountered in medical education. Uh, you know, from your experience or generally from EMSA in Europe. Um, sure. So I can um, maybe just to be a little general about it. Um, one thing that we continuously see um, is that um, in, in lectures, in undergraduate lectures, um, you'll have professors who have, um, who have conflicts of interest that they don't declare. And that's something that um, is, you know, people are trying to implement this. Some universities are implementing this and it's kind of, it, it is looked at as um, good scientific practice to declare your, science, um, your conflicts of interest at this point. 
But um, many times we, we see that it's not the case, even though there is an obvious conflict of interest. Um, so this is something that that is sort of at the core of what we feel like we need to target in a medical education setting, because if you have a pharmacology professor um, holding a lecture on some sort of uh, medication, um, while they're actually affiliated with the pharmaceutical company and they don't declare it at the beginning of the lecture, um, it'll have a very, uh, very different outcome on uh, the way that the students kind of um, question the actual material that's being uh, talked about in the lecture. Um, and this is something that's, um, that's really important for sort of critical thinking and decision-making for the students and for future doctors, obviously. Um, so this is just something that's, I think that's kind of the most, um, the most basic, but also the most important example of the way that this is really uh, shown in a medical education setting. Thank you very much. Uh... There is actually one, one, I mean, there are lots of interesting questions. It's hard to pick, but, but I'm going to go with this one. Um, with hearing that so many psychiatrists may not give the full information on drugs because they don't know uh, the full information. So again, we come back to the medical education. Um, why, why aren't psychiatrists properly thought on how to safely withdraw patients from medical education? Any thoughts, any thoughts on that? Stevie, Peter? From, from from your from your your experience, why would you say that that the psychiatrists don't know or NG uh, how to guide patients through this process? I have to say I'm I'm a little bit um, disappointed in the leadership shown by senior members of uh, the medical profession, psychiatric profession, and the professional bodies. I think that the data emerging about the adverse effects of medication and some of the theoretical challenges to why they're prescribed is defended against. So we see very senior psychiatrists saying, I've never seen a withdrawal reaction. I've never seen anybody having an adverse effect. Now, I'm not saying that those people are lying. So I haven't said that they're lying, but we do see senior psychiatrists saying, I've never seen it, doesn't happen, Ooh, downplay. Uh, some people have some side effects, last for a couple of weeks. So for me, um, I think the rank and file doctors probably take that leadership and think that the medication is relatively benign, very effective, doesn't have many side effects, because effectively that's what the leadership encourages of them. So I have, I have some disappointment in how the professions are responding to the emerging data, to be honest. Yeah, I, if I can Andrew? say, I mean, we're, wait, we're waiting for some the Royal College of GPs to pay some attention um, to the work that we've been doing. We're, we've managed to get the Royal College of Psychiatry to change a, their position statement on um, withdrawal from antidepressants, but the Royal College of GPs is um, very loudly silent. So, yeah, and I, th and I think UK is ahead of us because the APA is silent here. They haven't said a word about the new guidelines released, the NICE guidelines in the UK. I just wanted to say, not that I'm happy that they're not um, involved in de-prescribing, but in absence of that, maybe for the audience that doesn't know, there is like, what happened is it, it drove patients because there was no medical help. It drove patients online and they looked for peer groups and support groups. And so they have created almost their science, their own science and wisdom in absence of medical help, which if you think about it is very revolutionary, right? The experts are the patients with their own bodies who, as you saw in the film, have to taper and figure out what way is going to work for them. And I have to tell you, um, it's really scary the stories that I see in here because I've been in these support groups for five years. It's the, it's the way that I survived this experience, figuring out, oh my God, I'm not, maybe I'm not like having some new mental illness. This is really a, a, from coming off the drug too fast, the way the doctor took me off. Um, so there's probably, I could show you probably 100,000 patients online right now that are tapering without medical help. And to say that they are, they are the experts in their own tapers and they're managing their own tapers with peer support, um, the best of their ability, because there just is no other help. But think about that. The, the expertise is, is in the patient population, not in a hospital. Yes, but if, I'm, if I may add a bit to that, I mean, one of the things that came out loud and clear from our research is that there is no effective feedback system for patients. And we've seen this recently, again, in the UK with the, uh, with the Cumberledge report, uh, with the, the women that were having problems with vaginal mesh and another, uh, a number of other, um, 
um, drugs and medical procedures. So what we're what we're lacking is an independent, proactive, continuous improvement loop. For one, one, wanting to use a manufacturing term from my old working days, we're we're working within a system here where the experience and feedback of hundreds of thousands of people that, that Angie was just referring to, they, the, the, those experiences actually have to be ignored by everybody in favor of the short-term results that Peter was referring to um, from the, the short-term results of the trials because we have this evidence-based system, which I'm sure when it was effective, when it was created was deemed to be the best way to help patients. But actually, it's deeply flawed and has swung entirely in favour of the drug companies and absolutely has to change. We must be able to hear the patient voice. And the patient voice on, voice on antidepressants has been shouting for 20 years. But again, that speaks to the human rights in, in mental health, that if you're with a label, you're not to be trusted. You don't know your own body. You don't know, you have a lack of insight. So all these things are just twisted around on each other it's almost like a, a medical gaslighting or something. Cause it happened to me when I said to my doctor, I read the research, I have a master's degree. Benzodiazepine withdrawal is what's happening to me. And it was written in my record that, that I believed in this fairy tale of benzo withdrawal, that, that I must be delusional to believe that that was what was happening to me. So it's a problem. Uh, concerning depression and guidelines, uh, in Germany, we have a very good guideline concerning depression. It was developed by a multitude of medical societies and social workers and psychologists and everybody participated. And it even has, has a small chapter about, uh, uh, about um, uh, withdrawal. And there are many psycho, psychosocial aspects. The guideline is okay. But to get that guideline and, and the evidence behind that guideline into practice, that's the problem. We don't have the structures, we have don't the personal and so we, we do have the signs and it's written up very well in that guideline, but it's not easy to get that into practice. And 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 and, and the practice angle is very interesting actually. And there's one question about about this coming from a from a from a physician from the US, uh, but asking about the situation in Europe, and 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 that's actually quite quite interesting. It, it links the the issue of stigma, costs, and time, and the you know and the and the healthcare systems in Europe, um, with the alternatives. So the question is um, whether it often comes down to stigma, cost, and time uh, that prohibits patients from seeking alternatives, uh, for example, behavioral th you know therapy and expect uh, that their physicians prescribe medication as the magic bullet. So, so, so how would you comment on that? Is this, can stigma costs time, but maybe stigma play a role in, 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 in being aware or seeking alternatives to, um, to medication in mental health care? Anyone would like to comment on that? That presupposes there are alternatives within a prescribing system, and uh, there is somewhat of an absence of those, certainly in the UK, um, for people to be sent to. But again, um, as far as um, again, I, I'm I'm thinking about first um, first prescriptions going to a GP, a general practitioner, that type of thing. Um, the guidelines say that for very mild depression, al other alternatives should be sought. Um, and the, I think the guidelines actually say that um, antidepressants should only be given for moderate to severe depression. However, doctors find that there is nothing in their toolkits other than um, the prescription pad and an antidepressant, which is why it's so easy to turn to. And as I mentioned earlier, the belief is that they're safe and effective and um, they're, they're cheap. Well, I, I think there's another element, which is we ask for for them. We go to our family doctors, we go to our primary care physicians, and we request them. Now, if you read James Davis's book, Cracked, you can see some of the insights into what pharmaceutical industry has done over the years, which is generate that consumer demand. You know, they've been extremely effective, along with defeat depression, that most members of the public know that if they're feeling utterly terrible, 
that one of the options is to go to their GP and ask for drugs. They know that. And maybe it's good that they know it. But I think some of this demand is not only coming from the pharmaceutical industry, although they're more than happy to make profit out of it. And I don't think it's coming from doctors who are, who are kind of drug happy pill pushers. I think people turn up at their GP and say, I really want something. And when the GP says, do you know what? Actually, exercise would be really, really good for you. I mean, one of my closest friends is, is a GP, he's my GP, and his patients are disappointed in him if he doesn't give them a prescription. So we've created the perfect uh, opportunity for marketing. These, these, you know, we desperately want to have the latest iPhone and we desperately want to have pills from our doctor. So that in some way, the GPs are actually resisting the pressure from their patients and that puts them in an extremely difficult position, I think. So they're not all only pushing drugs on their patients, their patients are, are actively wanting the drugs, which is a little bit sad. So I, I so in I some respect, it's a, fo it's a folly yeah. I do. And what patients and doctors often do not know is that the newest drug is not the best drug. But what I can tell you is that the iPhone 12 is better than the iPhone 10. So I, I completely agree with Peter that it's that is part of it. Part of the problem is maybe not stigma directly, but it's the lack of education. Um, on both sides, on patient side on, and on the professional side. And what I really find is that um, many patients may have tried exercise and everything, but they don't give themselves enough time. When I say, okay, many, many mental illnesses have lots of time over months and years maybe to grow in your brain. And then um, now you get some diagnosis and you think, okay, now I've been to therapy for two months and it really should be better. And I always try to tell them, okay, look at the time you've been sick. And for me, it has been more oh, over 10 years. And so I can't really, I can't really think that after one year of therapy, it's all back to normal. It takes a decent amount of time. Um, and I do understand that sometimes it's really the, I want to be better now. And if a pill can help, then, then take it. So this is what I try to teach other service users, you have to be patient with yourselves. These things, um, if you do it with exercise, with therapy, with uh, mindfulness, with all these alternatives, it does take longer, but the effect lasts longer as well because the medication might help you for, for a short time, but long-term, mm, not so sure. But if you go the other way, the way might be a bit more bumpy and uh, you may have some relapses, but you can always learn from those. And this way will actually lead to a destination where you can really stay. So this is something I think we need to educate people about mental health, about mental illness, about all the things that have an influence on this uh, so they can go better into educated to their GP, but also with the GP, with the professionals, um, educating them more in this direction. But what I see, at least here in Germany, that I got the feeling that the younger generation of um, professionals, of um, students of medicine and stuff, they do already have a different approach. So I really have hope that with the newer generations of professionals, we slowly will manage this shift away from, okay, here's your pill to, mm, okay, exercise for four weeks and then we see us again or anything. So this is really my hope, but also we have to work on the education part on, on the patient side as well. Yeah, and just for the, for the US point of view, I think you're lucky in the EU that we, you, you all don't have direct to consumer advertising in the United States. It's, it's, we're bombarded with it, it's all day. Um, it's even like become this cultural phenomenon, you know, that people joke that there's pumpkin spice Xanax for Halloween and there's, you can buy tennis shoes with the pills all over them. You know, it's everywhere. It's in the TV, it's in the streaming service, it's on cable. And, and, and kind of, it was, I don't think it was in this version of the film, but the parents in the film were talking about, you know, like teenagers having the language for saying like, I have depression, I have anxiety. You know, it's, it's almost like it's an identity. Like this is me, this is who I am. It's just, it's, it's all over the US. Thanks. One last question before we move on to the final round. Um, it's something that 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 uh, a couple of experts that that Mental Health Europe works closely closely with uh, started kind of raising some some months ago. It's in the light of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic and, and mental health uh, burden that is placed on people, you know, worldwide. 
there's this there's this narrative and risk as well that that you know that that COVID nineteen will um, result in the next mental health epidemic or even a pandemic, and, and indeed we see um, increasingly data coming from different from different countries uh, on mental health burden. But what we also see is increase in prescriptions coming, for example, from France and UK and other countries. What is your take on that? Do you see you know COVID nineteen to be a trigger for again kind of a next you know a wave in 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 over reliance on 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 medication again as the as the resource and a first line kind of response to the burden that that our society now is experiencing anyone would like to comment on that well what i've seen in with people around me me having been through lots of crises i have lots of tools to work with the situation how it is right now but all the people who have not have my history and not have been through crisis, they are now going, what should I do? I, I, I can't cope with it. They don't have any tools. So I'm really um, in an advan adva advantages um, um, for, to them. And I think this is really, I think this is part of the, of the thing right now that many people who have, haven't had to deal with um, harder times in their lives, these are hard times and um, really we all should be quite patient with ourselves but many people have never had this before and so they are looking for for a quick fix and they don't have, maybe they don't have people like me standing beside them no you, you have to feel your feelings you have to feel your thoughts and it's okay to not be okay in times like these it's really crazy out there and there's no one size fits all solution for us but um some people just just they 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 can't deal with it and so they cry for help and sometimes this help maybe um, that somebody prescribes them some pills. Oh, I, I, I think it's worse than that. I, I think that by prescribing pills, we're not only potentially burdening people with the, the dependence, for, the, you know, the dependence consequences of this, the, the chemical effects on them, but I think we're taking ourselves away from the fact that the coronavirus pandemic it, it is a system-wide, community-wide threat to people and threat to our economies and we need a collective pan-european around the world response people need to have their incomes and their jobs protected people need to have their housing protected women need to be protected from abusive partners when they're locked up to protect themselves from social distancing there are political and social acts that people need so the danger of seeing this as a as a mental health pandemic and using medication to help people is not only the possible consequences that we're applying the wrong solution to what is undoubtedly a problem, but we're taking ourselves away from some of the actions that we want. I mean, God knows, we're, we're, we're supposedly governed. We're not really governed. We've got some, some um, incompetent clown sitting in number 10 in the UK. But the idea that Boris Johnson would relinquish his responsibilities to protect the income and living conditions of the citizens in favour of giving lucrative contracts to his mate and putting depressed people on antidepressants, of course he would. So I think it's not only that it's a threat that we'll use the wrong mental health interventions, but there's a threat that will take our eye off the collective need to respond as a, as a, as a society to the threats of coronavirus. So individualizing as well as uh, pathologizing, I think is a risk here. Sorry, I went, I went off on a, on a rant, but I think that the pathologizing um, mental health illness response to the coronavirus pandemic is, is missing the point. It's a collective trauma that we have to respond to with social action and with political and economic action. It's not a, a crisis of individualized disorders. It just isn't. And I yeah, I don't want to beat the, beat the dead horse there, but I just find it fascinating that we can see that there's a clear cause, right? So Peter earlier said, you know, that you would go somewhere and be traumatized. It's a clear, there's a cause to PTSD. We see that clearly, but other illnesses are considered, oh, you just have a brain disease or an illness just fell on your brain and you have this chemical imbalance thing. So we're watching it in real time happen. There is a real threat. There's a collective trauma, but we're still blaming it on the individual and medicating it as if it were a chemical problem. And I just don't understand how we do that. Like we are watching our context has changed and our lack of security and poverty and all these things come, come down. It's still not a chemical imbalance. So speaking of political action, because that, that, that was mentioned, I would like to start that, to close a little bit and to wrap up our discussion. And um, by asking each of you, if you 
were now to to speak to a policymaker and and you know kind of try to wrap all uh, from your perspective that we discussed today and try to formulate one policy recommendation that is really key um, to you know to 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 your experience and to your perspective from where you watch the whole problem. What would that be? What would you tell people that have influence over the way that medicines are regulated? What would you tell people that have an impact on medical education? What would you say that have to people that have impact that have influence on on the way that that medication is prescribed? What would be your kind of final takeaway message and a policy re recommendation that we as Mental Health Europe can also take forward? Stevie. Shall I start? Uh well, if you if um, you may be aware that we had a Public Health England review um, of prescribed um, prescribed medication that is dependence forming, and there have some um, there were a, a number of recommendations that came out of that. Unfortunately, there are already are some movements um, within the UK, and this does really kind of fit into your question. We have NHS England and NHS Improvement who have a, a, a prescribed medicines oversight group um, to oversee some of the impl implementation um, of the recommendations from the Public Health England Review. And I'm working with a group of people um, who uh, currently are involved in existing support services for prescribed medication and a, a, a group, of, uh, and there are those of us with lived experience in this. And what we are hoping to be able to introduce um, are one or two things which I think are absolutely crucial um, in order to um, have change. Um, it may not be seen at sort of a macro level, it, it's more at grassroots level, but what goes on particularly with prescriptions of things like benzos and antidepressants is it happens in the GP surgery. So we are looking for um, having a role within a GP surgery of someone who is a prescribed medication specialist who can, if the GP and the patient decide that medication is what is required, an antidepressant, whatever is required, uh, de dependence forming medication is, is required, that there is someone to actually talk through all the details with the patient and lead on to a proper informed consent, because informed consent is absolutely vital at this point, a, a literally a signature, an informed consent which takes place. And I think that that will be a major step forward. It will give patients the opportunity to go, whoa, this isn't right for me, or okay, but I understand the issue. Or, okay, and I understand the issues down the line of side effects, withdrawal effects, and, and that there will be somebody there to help me along the way. And we have none of that at the moment. And um, a patient feedback system, please, it's desperate we must introduce something along those lines that works within the health service of every country. Thank you, Stevie, very much. Who's going next? I want to hear some fascinating policy recommendations now to put to the policymakers. Um, I can go uh, next. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, what I, um, obviously from my perspective, coming from the kind of issue of the conflicts of interest in medical education settings, I think it'd be really essential for um, maybe the European Union or just some um, sort of obviously policy body to kind of uh, ensure that there are actual guidelines on this um, that are to some extent reachable for universities to implement sort of uh, tackling the problem that I mentioned, for example, the not declaring conflicts of interest. I think that's, that should be behind us by now. It should be, it should be common practice and it should be um, required, in my opinion, um, to have um, that sort of kind of declaration in place. Um, so uh, obviously awareness is the one issue. The other issue is um, I mentioned the American Medical Students Association had um, created these guidelines they actually have this uh, sort of guideline of a farm free curriculum, it's called, um, where they uh, define some competencies that medical students sort of need to learn actually in a medical curriculum to combat these conflicts of interest. And I think uh, something like that, some kind of recommendation in that direction would be really essential to have across Europe. Thank you, Stella. And I think there's there's a group that is uh, you know I'm not sure it's a, it's a, it's 100 sibling organization from states and I think it's actually a partner of medicating normal it's called farmed out 
and they have lots of you know resources on on, on kind of you know clearing up the, the the medical curricula from the pharmaceutical industry influence anyone else my, my advice in one sentence would be liberate medical education and medical science from industry influence and uh, the solutions would be technically easy i think we could write them down in 15 minutes or 30 minutes but it's the political barriers which are very high and we have to somehow uh, it's a question of power of course the pharmaceutical industry has sales of more than 800 billion dollars in 2019 and it will be 1.4 trillion that's 10 by the power of 10 trillion dollars in 2026 and this is something and I feel somewhat small when I consider these sums, but uh, somehow we have to gain ground with small steps, like Stella said, for example. And there are many more possibilities, and I think it's very important to unite that all people who want to liberate medical education and science that they that we find that we see the common ground and work on that common ground. And for me, my, my recommendations would be all patient centered, uh, all funding for alternatives, um, health literacy for the average patient. They don't know how to read an FDA pamphlet to see what does the medication even do? What are the side effects? What does that mean? Um, another thing I learned, I did an internship as an outpatient mental health therapist in community mental health. And I, I learned very quickly that most people have no idea how they're feeling. When you ask someone, how are you feeling right now? There's just like a not an internal we just learn, don't learn those skills. Like, how do I feel? Where could that be coming from? What can I change in my life to make that better? You know, how do I communicate? So I think almost like teaching children and teens, like how to self-regulate, how to communicate their feelings more effectively, how to feel your feelings and not be afraid of them. Um, and then how to seek, seek out that help, but you know, more informed. So it would be all patient. I don't have much hope for the system, unfortunately. <laughs> it's very slow moving. I can see some 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 positive feedback to what you said in the chat. It's it's it's. I think it's really really important and and to empower users and patients to 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 and to strengthen mental health you know literacy in the society in general. Uh, I think it's I think it's crucial and to fight stigma as well. At the same time, it it, it all it's all kind of tied together. Dominique, Peter, any any final words? Angie, Angie has said it all. Um, my wish to the mental health fairy would be that no pupil goes to school through education without learning about mental health. And this includes um, taking care of your feelings, taking care of yourself. And I think this could be an important tool against over-medication and against um, all sorts of things. So I completely go with Angie there. So uh, I, I think implement everything everybody else has said, obviously. Um, I would add two things. One is um, many of my psychiatry colleagues claim that they use a biopsychosocial model, but I would go with Denias Puras's advice to the UN. Let's move from a biomedical model to a, a, a psychosocial model of mental health, a rights-based model, uh, a, a service user-centered model, a, a, a problem-solving model, a normalizing model. So I, I would do not necessarily policies, but I would see political leadership from that perspective. And I, I think we're starting to see some of that in the UK. The policy that I would implement would be about the reporting of both adverse effects and uh, outcomes from drug trials. And I would um, use the regulatory and approvals process to uh, put enormous pressure on the pharmaceutical manufacturers and uh, those biochemists who develop the drugs to make sure they report long term uh, beneficial outcomes and that the, they are told what adverse effects to look at for rather than choosing themselves to look for only those ones that they want to look for. So I, I would put pressure on the outcome and adverse effect data that goes into the uh, approval of medication. Uh, and like I say, I'd adopt Denias Puras's vision for a psychosocial perspective on mental health. Yeah, and I even Thank you very much, Peter. And if I can just wrap up with one sentence, that that, that actually answers one of the questions that we, we we got in the in the Q and A about the global action. And then I think uh, they, you know Daniel Spurs re reports and opinions that he submitted as a as a, as a special uh, special rapporteur 
I think it, it kind of, you know, it explains in a nutshell very much, you know, what we are talking here about. It also helped to guide a mental health Europe's work in this field. And it really has lots of recommendations on what needs to change at the global level, how we think about mental health, you know, ready to trigger change at the lower levels and to really see that, you know, changing in practice. So I'm, I fully, fully agree as you, you know, that there is a need at, for action at, at many, many levels and with involvement of many stakeholders. And on that note, I'm also happy to see, uh, you know, lots of lots of our members and lots of, I can recognize some names from different organizations jo jo joining us that we also work with as Mental Health Europe on transparency and and tackling pharmaceutical, you know, marketing and also on mental health policies. So I, I see the light in the tunnel at the end of the day. I think I think what we discussed here, it's, you know, it's, it's also very important as well to raise awareness. We had lots of people joining us and listening to this discussion and asking questions. So I think it's, it's, uh, it was very, very useful for, for people listening uh, to us tonight. Um, what I want to say from, from the side of Mental Health Europe is that we will uh, prepare a short summary of this discussion and we'll of course continue working on, 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 on the things that I mentioned. Um, so on the Shedding Light project and, and on a series of, of short guides on mental health, we'll continue our partnership with the European Medical Students Association and other and other organizations. So on that, I would like to also thank you all for joining us. Thank you all the speakers for your active contributions. And I think at this stage, I need to pass it on to Angie for a final, final closure. Thank you very much once yeah, again. Th thank you Mental Health Europe for uh, hosting this discussion. We do these worldwide. So if you know an organization that you think would like to do one of these, please contact us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. <laughs> And for a list of upcoming events, there's some really exciting ones. There's some um, in, more in Europe. Look on our website, it's medicatingnormal.com. We also have a reading list, alternatives, resources, research, just about anything you could use. And social media, follow us, follow us on all the social media platforms. Thank you so much for joining us, it was awesome. Thank you very much and have a nice evening or good night. <laughs>